Good morning. Chris, thank you, and to the committee. Um, it, it really is an honor to be here. I know that that's supposed to be part of the script that speakers are supposed to say, but it really is. Um, I'm, I've been very fortunate in the work that I've been doing for more than two decades looking at IT issues. I find that when I go to campuses and people think that I know something, I get better than I give because I try to engage in a conversation. And so in that context, I would like to have a conversation with you today, if I find my clicker, about a variety of, of IT issues. Uh, I struggled with a title. We're obligated to come up with a title. And it, it seems to me that in one sense, uh, we are in the fourth decade of the so-called IT revolution. If you think about the arrival of, of what we used to call microcomputers, in the consumer economy, in the corporate world, and on campus that began in the, really in the late 1970s, but effectively with the arrival of the IBM PC and the Macintosh in the early 80s, this is now the fourth decade. And it's a fair set of questions. You know, many of us have come of age with this. Many of us had to, to be retrofitted with this. Um, I am not a CS person. I am not a computer scientist. I'm not an engineer. I can't write a line of code to save my life. I, yes, I, I, was a dissert, I did my dissertation work using a mainframe at UCLA. Uh, I'm a defrock social scientist. My background is survey research. My, my professional career began with the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA. Some of you know the institute for its works with an annual survey of college freshmen, some 300,000 a year, across all sectors, community colleges, HBCUs, research universities, liberal arts colleges. My interest in the technology was not one of the technology, but one about the planning and policy issues. And a recurring theme in my, com my presentation, and really what I hope will be a conversation today, is first and foremost, the technology issues are not about technology. If you think about the religious wars that we used to have on campus, HP versus IBM, Macintosh versus Windows, that's the easy stuff. The hard stuff is what do we do with it? How do we make sense of it? How do we know that it makes a difference? How do we get extract value? It comes down to planning and people and policy. It comes down to budgets. It comes down to the question of how do we move from epiphany to evidence in our understanding of what the technology does or does not do and does or does not do well. Um, so that, that's the conversation I would like to have today in terms of um, what I do in the time I have. Um, higher education wants to be global. So in my reach for a subtitle for my presentation today, I thought I'd look for some cross-cultural subtitles. Uh, Google Translate is a wonderful device if you, you know, your language skills are limited. I don't speak Chinese. I'm told that Google Translate does about 80% to 90% depending on the language. But in China, if I were looking for a subtitle, it would be, care be careful what you wish for. If you think about the great aspirations we've had for technology and education at large, um, in fact, now we've got it and now we have to deliver on it. Uh, this is the old be careful what you wish for, you may get it. It's the dog who finally chase gets the car. Um, you know, in, in, the, in the world of, of the great liberal arts and, of course, the Romance languages, the French have a very nice expression that says, plus qu'on change, la même qu'on change. It's about all I remember from my high school French. Um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And, you know, that, we know that to be true in so many ways. And my colleagues in Brazil, I've been fortunate to do, be doing work in South America. We have a, a group that actually license our work. Uh, anybody speak Portuguese? Um, I'm told that it, it, the expression is, and my Portuguese is terrible, Musa Moses Mudam, it really translates as, and it's a very much, it's a much earthier version of Pluka Challenge, it's only the flies change. A lot of the core issues stay the same. That's a very polite rendition of what, what goes on. And I think that that's, that's true with so much of what we do in academia, we, we, particularly in the conversation about technology, because it all seems to be so new, and yet a lot of the issues are really, they don't change. The, tech, the toys change. The technologies change, but the issues about how do we make effective use of the technologies in instruction for analytic purposes, that part doesn't change much at all. So I'm going to do something I think which is very different from what other speakers have done. Um, first, my conversation with you today, my presentation is going to map some stuff. I'm not going to focus exclusively on one issue, but I, I want to begin not with, a not with a presentation about technology. I want to begin with a conversation about how you got here. And some smart ass in the room is going to say, yes, I drove, right? So can we get rid of that? I want, to, I want to get into the conversation about how you got here in the sense of an academic. How many of you are faculty members? I, I know this is a faculty conference. I'm sure others have slipped in, right? Okay. Um, that's fine. That's okay. Um, higher education, academia is a recruited career. If you think about college students, 
if you think about going to college, and, and, and for a number of years, again, I was the operating officer for the freshman survey, we would ask tens of thousands of college students, year in and year out, what do you want to be with your major, what's your expected career? College students don't, you know, kids don't go to college to become college professors. They want to be attorneys, they want to be business professionals, they want to be doctors, engineers, they want to be lawyers, they want to be wealthy, they want to be happy, they want something. But, you know, being a college professor is not high on that process. <coughs> Excuse me. We have few role models. I mean, unless you grew up in a college town or somebody living next to you is a college professor, think about the media models for college professors. They're terrible. They really are. We are idiosyncratic. We are mad scientists. We are forgetful. Richard Dreyfuss had one chance to redeem us, and, and he didn't last a full season when he had a show about a very impassioned college professor, but he was so angry that nobody could get along with him. That's not a great role model in terms of kids thinking, oh, I want to do this with my life. And so the way you got here, I'm guessing, and I want, I want to explore this for a few moments in a conversation, not a, and move the slides aside, somebody touched you, I'm guessing. Hopefully it was safe touch, right? That <laughs> took a moment, right? Okay. It should have been safe touch. But in fact, somebody touched you and said, you know, you're interested in the sciences, you're interested in the social sciences, whatever it might be. Come join us. We have a secret handshake. We have, you know, tweed cloth as opposed to sackcloth, whatever it might be. But come join us. And it's somewhere along the way, somebody did something to say, come join us. You got a call. Somebody said, you can do this. Not just to go to graduate school, not just to get a graduate degree, but then to come back. And particularly at an institution like this one, where there is a special mission, there is a special history, even more so in terms of what draws people to, to, individual, to individual institutions and to academe. I mean, can we do a moment of confessional? Can, can, will some of you share with us that moment? Because I'm guessing that, again, how many of you really went to college thinking I'm gonna be a college professor? Anybody in the room, honestly? So either I'm going to call you out or you're going to have to sort of stand up. I'm not, you know, I have the safety. I'm going to get back on an airplane in two days. So, you know, you can be mad at me and I'm gone. But how did you get to be a, how did, how is it that you decided to be a college professor? How is it you wanted to be an academic? Please. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Others? How did you get here? Who touched you safely, right? <laughs> Believed in you, said you could do this, and provided that guidance initially as an undergraduate, and then hopefully so if you had a successful experience in graduate school. My advisor actually in my doctor's program. Mm -hmm. He's the one who did think about this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I spend a lot of my time as a faculty. As a good is what I'm doing now when I was a faculty. Yeah. Others? How did you get here? Please. And who got you into graduate school? Because that's where the first touch occurs, isn't it? Somebody believing you and saying, you can do this. Please. Well, I was born in Greece, came here a long time ago. I wanted to be an airplane designer. Mm -hmm. I was good at math. I still do a little bit of math and statistics here. But when I finished college and I had no more money, I wanted to go back home to Greece. And the English professor said to me, no, you are a graduate student. Mm -hmm. I said, I have no money. So they said, don't worry about that. We'll send you to Berkeley. Yeah. That's where I ended up being. And mm -hmm. then from there in New York, and then the rest of it is just follow up my own desire. Somebody grabbed you by the neck and pointed you in the right direction and, and eased the way in, in one sense. <laughs> Others? Okay, but it, it's a very interesting process about how we get here. And I think where our rewards come is also about doing that for others, isn't it? You know, it, in the sense it's not all our students, maybe not 20 or 30 a year, but the two or three or five where we can, again, safe touch and help and direct and make it, you know, where, where we can see it. Some, often we don't get to see it. Often we don't get to see it. But, Sometimes we do, and it's those moments when we do consistently and over time, you know, if we sign somebody as a freshman or a sophomore and, and we're able to watch it, that's what we do. 
that's what we do. And, and so the conversation really about technology is where do we find this middle ground in one sense? Because there is this tension. Some of you may recall John Nabrit's book, Megatrends, in 1982, 30 years ago. And one of the 10 megatrends that he talked about was the tension between high tech and high touch. And we've certainly seen that in education. If you think back to the, the election in the mid-1990s about, and, and all the hype, particularly after the arrival, first with the, with the wave of the first wave of computers, and then with the arrival of the internet, what Tom Friedman called the Netscape moment in 1995, 1996, gonna absolutely transform education, if I don't knock the microphone off. But this is part of a long stream of great expectations. Thomas Edison at the turn of the last century thought that movies would supplant books as the medium of instruction in elementary and secondary education by the mid-1930s. Didn't happen. But it was a new technology. Edison said, yeah, movies are going to just, why bother with books? We have movies. Didn't work. But it was the experience of using film as a propaganda and training resource during the Second World War that became a catalyst for film going into the schools in the 1950s. Um, I'm old enough to remember new math. Some of you looking around the room with gray or thinning hair um, may have had that experience as well. You know, Sputnik went up, new math came down, everything changed very quickly, and it brought incredible stuff into the classroom. It didn't bring the internet, but it brought film in a way that had never been used before. The Bell and Howell series, Hemo the Magnificent, a lot of the science stuff. This was an early version of the internet, not because it was technology, but it was a new kind of technology, and it brought enriching resources that were not available at the fingertips of the classroom teacher, that were engaging, that brought new information, new ways of presenting stuff. Um, and that's what the technology does on the instructional side as well. How does it touch? How does it engage? And for, I think, those of us who teach, those of us who are supporting folks who teach, it's where do we find the middle ground. It's not technology is going to take our jobs, it's, it's how do we do tech-enabled high touch, whether we do it in a classroom or we do it through distance or online education programs. Finding that, that unique equilibrium, if you will, that we are allowed to add personal value and do the touch that worked for us. So I want, I want to start that conversation because I think it's, it sets a tone and tenor over the conversation about technology that's very different than just launching into the traditional death by PowerPoint. You know, now how did you get here and then what does that say about your expectations for the way you teach and what you do? So we took care of academic careers. Where we're going to go over the next, in, in the rest of this, is I want to talk a bit about um, the context, the fourth decade of the, the technology revolution. I want to talk a little bit about presidents and we recently completed a survey of college presidents with Inside Higher Ed. Some 950 presidents talked with us about a variety of issues related to the economic downturn, but it was also one of the first surveys I'm aware of that asked presidents to rate the effectiveness of IT investments and some other stuff that I think becomes important in this conversation about understanding technology. I want to map the terrain a little bit uh, about some of the technologies that are important, that are emerging, that we need to, pay, need to attend to, whether we're dealing on campus or online programs and some of the issues that affect both. I want to talk about assessment. And I want to change, I hopefully, I want to give you, I hope, a sense of how we can change that conversation because too often the conversation about assessment is about penalizing people. I think the conversation that we need to have is one about analytics. It's about using data, bringing data to the conversation. Many of you have heard the Deming dictum, in God we trust, all others bring data. Mrs. Spellings was using it when she was Secretary of Education and uh, was widely quoted. She said, back in Texas, we like to say, in God we trust, all others bring data. Uh, turns out she didn't originate that. It's another case of the Bush administration not having done really good research on some stuff. That usually gets a laugh too, but maybe it's, um, or not. Uh, but it is a case of, of, of the context that we are in right now in education at all levels is one about bringing data to the conversation. But the issue is not, is not to use data as a weapon, it's to use data as a resource. Not what have you done wrong, but how do we do better? How do we connect the dots and find a path using analytic tools individually and for our students and for our programs? So the first fourth decade of the computer revolution, at least my map on this thing, I'm sorry, can we take down the lights? It might be a little bit, I see people straining. Is there, I, I'm not qualified to use a light switch. So it might be a little easier to read some of the slides. My take is that at each decade has had kind of a defining technology. You, and, and it's not clearly 1980 to 1989, but if you think about the 80s, it was the arrival of the personal computer. How many of you were doing email sometime by 1980, sometime by the end of the decade? How many of you had, or how many of you had an email account by 1989? Okay. 
How many of you sent your first email sometime in between 1990 and 1999? Okay, how many of you hate email? That's, they're not mutually exclusive groups, by the way, are they? They're not mutually exclusive groups. But it was the arrival of personal computers. You didn't have to go to the computer center to do stuff, right? You didn't, uh, I had a colleague who used to talk about the arrival of compu personal computers as the, as the technological equivalent of the Protestant Reformation. You were no longer dependent upon the priests in the computer center. You could worship at, at your desk. I'm sorry. So, and for a lot of us, it was free. And a lot of us, it, was, it brought us into the quagmire. Again, for me, it was absolutely the case. I was doing large-scale social science research and running stat packages on a big computer at UCLA. But a lot of smaller stuff and financial stuff and what you could begin to do on a spreadsheet. Think back to the first time you saw a spreadsheet. You know, whether you're doing financial analysis or you're doing just calculations, as opposed to the first time you used a calculator and you saw the ripple left, you know, down and across, and you had this, oh, wow, or probably even a more stronger term in terms of watching somebody doing that and then doing it yourself, and what that enabled in the sense of possibility and potential, or graphics, or a variety of the sort of the first generation of applications, just on a personal computer not connected to the network. 1990s, it became the internet and the web, Again, Tom Friedman has written elegantly about this uh, across all sectors and his discussion of the world is flat, that this is the Netscape moment, 1995, when things changed dramatically in terms of enabling and connecting and a variety of things. Um, probably for the last couple of years, it's wireless. We are now mobile. Uh, it's been slow. It really began not, you know, there were some campuses and, and consumer spots that were going wireless around 2001, 2002, but certainly the last latter half the sense that you, know, you now have a mobility and you don't have to be tethered has been both a great thing and a terrible thing. Many of us are dependent upon our smartphones and at the same time we'd like to throw them out because it becomes a leash in many ways. People can find you and sometimes you just don't want to be found initially with your cell phone number and then by extension you know, with email and texting and other kinds of things. And probably for the decade going forward it's social media. Facebook and other kinds of things that we have yet to see, or the extensions of a Facebook and other environment, in terms of fundamentally sort of defining that moment in time. With each one of these things, I think we see an interesting progression. So the first is, when they show up, they're initially cute, aren't they? I mean, if you remember doing, anybody do WordStar on an Apple II computer or a CPM computer? It was a, a wonderfully arthritic experience, wasn't it? Because you trying to do all these combinations of key uh, of finger combinations to do bold or underlining or other kinds of stuff. And then the software got a little better. So for, initially it was cute. People would dismiss it. Oh, that's cute. You've got an Apple II or you've got an IBM PC. Has 128K of memory. Bill Gates famously said, why anybody would ever need more than 512K of memory? It's just beyond me. And you know, today we throw away two gig of memory chips that come with stuff. Uh, then it becomes convenient, doesn't it? Think about word processing. For those of you that did master's thesis or class papers, you know, gee, no more typewriters. You can go back and edit online. You don't have to do serial stuff. Really incredibly convenient. And then, of course, it became compelling. And then from compelling, it became compulsory. Think about just something as simple as buying an airline ticket today. You know, that uh, you don't call anybody, do you? Because you, if, you if, if you try to talk with an agent as opposed to do this online, it takes longer. You get less information, and you pay more for what used to be the only way you could do it. You go online, whether it's the one airline or, or some of the sites like Kayak or Orbitz or some of the others, you can see a matrix of options and opportunities. You can get better information. You can shop for price and convenience. You can book it faster anytime you want. There's no, we're sorry, we're overloaded with phone calls right now, which they seem to be 24-7, but we'll get to you in, in the queue. Um, and in education, one of the interesting things is that given, again, the great aspirations we've had about technology, how do we deal with the aspirations against a current environment that says accountability? Because the, the challenge, I think, that we confront in both K-12 and higher ed is that we and the technology providers have made such great claims for technology, we have hyped it in many ways. The advocates and the evangelists have hyped it in so many ways, it's like, okay, show me. And the accountability metrics, whether it comes from a regents or a board or in the state capital, well, we gave you all this money. Why aren't test scores up as the easiest metric for accountability? 
You know, well, we put all this money into paving the road, the bumps, the potholes are gone. We've given you all this money for technology. Why aren't the educational potholes gone? In other words, why aren't test scores up? And we don't have a good response to that. We're still trying to figure this out because it's a very complex process. It's a very complex process. I would argue, and I, I said, this, said this a little earlier, the most significant technology issues really have nothing to do with technology. You know, we used to have bitter fights in many cases about IBM PCs versus HPs or gateways or the white boxes that came into the market, let alone the Mac stuff and the people who want Unix things. It seems kind of silly at this point, doesn't it? Um, the real issues are about planning and priorities. How do we set priorities for what we wish to do with technology? There's all this stuff that we can do. How do you target the ones that make the most sense in the context? What works at one institution may not work at another. This is not a medical intervention. Context really matters. It matters a tremendous amount in terms of thinking about infrastructure, thinking about resources, thinking about the student population, the faculty interest and support, leadership that comes from the administration about these issues. All this is part of an algorithm, and it varies from campus to campus. So what happens at one campus can be interesting and informative. It isn't necessarily predictive for what will happen at another campus if you follow that path. Um, it's about programs. How do we design? How do we develop? Who's responsible? How do we implement? What do we say are our objectives for these programs? How do we connect the dots? Who's responsible? How do we create infrastructure for whatever we're doing on these things? How do we know that the program works? How do we get beyond epiphany in our conversation about did what we said we wanted to do make a difference? How do we know that difference? We'll come back to that in a little bit. It's about institutional policy. I suspect somewhere in this audience is the outlier, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I mean it kind of in a statistical sense. The early adopters always take care of themselves, don't they, in one sense. They find a way. It's the rest of us who are trying to figure this out. We used to have pitched conversations, those folks, many of us who were doing early work in IT, about what's the way to motivate the faculty? Do you provide incentives to the early adopters and they will be role models for the rest of their colleagues? And we thought that that was going to be a good model, be kind of a social infection model. And it turns out it's not a social infection, it's a social intimidation. Is that the early adopters are going to survive and do it on their own no matter what. It's the rest of us that need help. And my colleague may get this and I don't. He or she may be comfortable. Pardon me. <clears throat> I'm not, but it turns out more often than not the early adopters intimidate rather than effectively infect the rest of us with some of the stuff. So we need to provide an infrastructure to make these things work. And what are the campus policies about this? And at the same time, the early adopters are also the ones that are sort of running off on their own. And sometimes you kind of need to rein them back in because it, sometimes it helps to have some little bit of planning about this. It's about people issues. It's not about toys. At the end of the day, it's people who use technology. It's not machines and software that use the technology. People have to feel comfortable with this stuff. We'll talk about visualization and technology a little bit later in the presentation. And ultimately, it's about the impact on pedagogy. It's about the impact on operations. How do we enhance campus services? And it's about services and outcomes. What kinds of conversations can we have? What kinds of investments can we make in people driving policy to build programs to affect pedagogy, to affect the learning experience of our students, the professional development of our faculty and our colleagues, and ultimately the enhancement of the opportunities we provide? So, I mentioned uh, we did a survey of college presidents, Inside Higher Ed. How many of you read Inside Higher Ed? It's free. It's, I, I work with them. I'm supposed to do that plug. That's the one commercial plug today. All right. Um, but Inside Higher Ed, it released in March a national survey of, of some 956 college presidents across all sectors. It was primarily about how campuses were responding to the, the economic downturn that began several years ago. But it was one of the first surveys, perhaps the only survey that I'm familiar with, that actually asked presidents. Tell us what you think about the effectiveness of the IT investments at your institution. And we asked about a couple of things. We asked about some operational issues. We asked some instructional ones. The numbers are not reassuring in terms of how presidents view technology. I, I want one other caveat about my presentation. I've been on campus for two hours. I am not talking about this institution. We have it on tape, OK? So any of you who said Green came in from California and he made this prescriptive comment about cop and state, I have it on tape, we will put it in the archives, that I did not say that and I put a disclaimer, I'm talking about things at large, okay? How your own hyperactive inference engines go with some of the stuff, I can't control that. But we asked presidents, so 
on a scale of one to seven, is it not effective or very effective? Tell us about how, you know, the investments you're making at IT. The number one rated issue was libraries. 50% of the presidents in aggregate across sectors said, yeah, the, the money we're putting in for IT and libraries is very effective. On the other hand, the presidents at places like Johns Hopkins, private research universities, only one president in eight, 13% said the investment in IT for on-campus instruction is very effective. That's not great. They spend a lot of money at, at Hopkins, as they do it all, as you do here, about supporting instructional IT. I don't think this is the fact that presidents don't believe in the technology. I think they're just probably as a group, again, I'm speaking as a group, are not well informed or just have not had good conversations about actually what's going on. And what's striking about these data is think about the profile of presidents. We asked, how old are you? How long have you been a president? These are presidents who have come of age with this technology, personally, professionally, over the course of their careers. The median age of the presidents in the survey was 57. Median service as a president was about six years. So these are folks who are, have not been dropped in. These are not college presidents who are 75 or 80 years old, who've had 30 year tenures. These are folks who have come of age with the technology over, over the course of the, as it arrived on campuses in the late 1980s, 1990s, and the instructional investments, the technology investments for research across the disciplines. These are pretty striking. Um, the other thing that we asked presidents was, well, tell us about a couple of things. Faculty are realistic. Not surprisingly, only half presidents think that faculty understand the challenges. I want to draw your attention to this one because this becomes, sets up an interesting contrast with the prior slide. Remember, the president said they weren't real sure about how effective the investment would be in information technology. Online ed, however, lots of presidential enthusiasm about that across sectors. And the next one, we will be able to serve more learners and we're going to be revenue. How are you going to do that if you've got a technology that you think is ineffective? Technology has not been all that effective, but you need technology to do online education. It sets up a real interesting set of issues in terms of looking at the way presidents really need to be better informed about a lot of these issues. I think our conversation about technology focuses on three questions. And, and, and this applies to, I think, almost all campuses, but they need to be contextualized. The first question is, why don't do faculty do more with IT and e-learning? There's still little pockets at campuses that even have great reputations for being highly wired. The question is, how do we do more? How do we do better? How do we build on what we've done? Uh, and a lot of campuses have no reputation. Are, are clearly laggards and, and where do they go? The second is, why don't colleges and universities make better use of IT resources? Let me tell you a story about Walmart in terms of IT resources, particularly the analytics side. How many of you are going to go to grocery stores, supermarket scanners, right? We're used to that. That's, they're collecting data about what you do, transactional data. And then you get an immediate response to that with coupons, don't you? You know, I mean, in one sense, you could say the learning management system is the equivalent of a supermarket scanner in higher education, because that's sort of the one way we get time on task data about our students. And some of the better research that we now finally have about learning management systems is very much suggesting it's time on task. If you look at some of the large population studies out of the University of Georgia system, the work that was done at Purdue, which has now been turned into a product, if you will, by SunGuard with the uh, Signals project uh, in terms of looking at data from student information systems, analytics, and LMS, it's an early warning system, but it's based largely about the transactional data out of the LMS linked with other aspects about students. But let me tell you a, sto a story about the consumer market that has relevance to the campus market. The year before Katrina devastated New Orleans, the Florida Keys were hit by three hurricanes. R routine occurrence in the Keys. Seemingly more routine of late, but two hurricanes down and one hurricane coming, the folks at Walmart said, we think we have a pretty good idea about what's going on in our stores that are in the path of the storm. Because Walmart, as you know, has a great rep it may not have a great reputation for some things, it has an incredible reputation for their information system and infrastructure. They know every person going in and every product going out, barcode by barcode and zip code by zip code. Two hurricanes down and one that's 90 hours out, folks at Walmart said, we think we have a pretty good idea about what's going on in terms of the rush to the stores that are in the path of the storm. And we know that people are buying, based on our just top level analysis as we look at this stuff, they're buying diapers and duct tape and water and snack food. And they may be buying plywood to nail up the windows. So we should stock up on those things for the stores that are in the path of this next storm. Somebody in Bentonville, corporate headquarters, said, you know, that's probably true, but let's check 
just to be sure. And they're checking not for next year, they're checking now for the storm that's 88 hours out, 87 hours out. They're dealing with this in real time. Lo and behold, they ran the data, terabytes of data, for the stores in the path of the storm. And yes, it was diapers and duct tape, it was water and snack foods. But there was one thing that just surprised the hell out of them. Absolutely unanticipated in terms of where there was a run during the run up to the storm. Beer. <laughs> it was like Super Bowl Sunday. I'm honest, I'm not making this stuff up, folks. New York Times talked about this uh, shortly after the storm. There was a huge run on beer for stores in the path of the storm. And so what does Walmart do? They don't put that away for the playbook for next year. They get on the phone with Anheuser-Busch and Miller and said, get, you know, bring beer to stores in the path of the storm so we can serve shoppers and shareholders. Now think about that in the context of your experience on a college campus. Again, I'm not talking about Cop and State, but you certainly have colleagues at other institutions who are, feel fortunate if they can get an accurate class list six weeks into the term, let alone any information that's feedback about their students that they can use midterm as opposed to, oh, this is what it looks like at the end of the term. So we have in the consumer economy ample experience with these kind of anal you know, immediate feedback analytics and the rest of the world turns and we now begin to turn and say, why not here? Why not us? As an example, of why aren't we doing the things that are increasingly common in the consumer economy? We see this in our students' attitudes about wireless. Well, there should be wireless. We're entitled to wireless and where's the app, right? Because the ubiquity of the technology in the consumer economy is raising expectations about what resources and services we need to provide on campuses. And the final one is how do we assess what kind of analytics do we use in our conversation about technology? Because the, the old stuff, persistence rates, retention rates, that's not about technology. Technology may be something that feeds into that, but that's just one of a variety of variables that are part of the algorithm that deals with something else. Technology is not going to improve retention in and of its own self. Whether it's on the instructional side or the analytics side, it's one of a number of tools to be used in the conversation about retention. And w consequently, the question becomes, how can we, what, what question should we ask about our use of technology? How do we assess the impact of technology? How do we define productivity? Do you want to have a contentious faculty meeting? Any economists in the room? Any of you sit or sleep through introductory economics? as an undergraduate. You know, economists are very fortunate because uh, they have a common agreement about what, how you define productivity, right? Um, things get, the quality gets better and it costs less to produce it, uh, different metrics, and they, they have agreement about the data. How would you like to have a conversation about academic productivity? You know, who wants to be in the meeting that begins with the definition of the data part? And yet, that's the conversation that's going to be, that's increasingly imposed on us from the outside. What we know, of course, is that technology is ubiquitous. It's everywhere these days. It, you know, think about just, for those of you who have been here at other institutions and have had careers for more than 10 or 15 years in higher education, email used to be a rite of passage at one point, wasn't it? You went to college and you got your email account. How do students apply to college today? It's all on email. Who bothers with postcards and papers for the most part? It's all done online. Students have email identities. They don't necessarily want your identity. That's why a lot of campuses can move their email services to Google and Microsoft. Because students already have an email identity before they arrive. In fact, the average undergraduate has 3.2 email accounts. One his or her parents may know about. A couple of others they probably don't know about. And then, of course, other ways to do that between texting and, and Facebook and other kinds of things. Uh, our reach still is not aligned with our grasp. We still have aspirations and we're not quite there yet. We have things that we would like to do, things that we can begin to visualize, but the reach and grasp issues are still there. It's the consumer experience that defines so much of the expectations about what we do, about what our students are expecting, whatever their ages. With, with due respect to the provost's comments earlier, we think that younger students know how to use the technology, but just because they can Google game and text doesn't mean that they can use it effectively for their academic work or the, the, the kinds of technology skills that they are, will need in the workplace. Many of you are, are in agreement with that. And you know, the problem is there's a greater penalty now, I think, uh, in terms of ignoring that upon arrival. Used to be that the equivalent of the, the, the technology training class for, for undergraduates was the library tour, right? How many of you remember passing on the library tour as undergraduates? We won't ask for a show of hands, but the voice vote 
sort of think about the consequences of passing on the technology tour, they're significant because it begins on day one. You know, you can sort of retrofit the library two or three weeks in, but getting to the web, finding the materials you need, navigating the campus, this is a day one. That's why many campuses are increasingly providing their students with self-assessment metrics. Before you arrive on campus, whether you are 18 or 38, take this metric, take this quick test. Can you do these things? If not, we've got online stuff to help you get up to par on basic skills and technology, as well as your other basic skills, because this is not about what you do after you leave. These are skills you need to have while you're here. There's huge pressure for us to document bang for bucks, isn't there? We've given you all this money, and unfortunately, again, you know, the Maryland legislature, anybody here in the legislature? I gotta, we're on tape, I gotta be very careful. You know, but I mean, the Maryland legislature is like many others. It's well-intentioned. I'm softening what I might say in other contexts if the tape are off. Um, but they have a responsibility about, fiduciary responsibility about we're giving you money to do stuff. If we know that if we pave the highway, the speed bumps go away, we don't know, and you can't necessarily tell us in a cogent manner, if we give you money for technology, have we taken the speed bumps out of education? Have we taken the potholes out of what happens in education, K-12 or higher ed? But we know you keep coming back and asking for more because they don't understand the technology is an operating cost, not a capital cost. It's not something you do once and it's good for 10 years. The useful life of a box is three years. There are huge people costs and support costs, so other things are like that along the way. Um, and there's this one. This is the Deming dictum again. In God we trust all others bring data. It's no longer sufficient for us to wander the halls and say, gee, I did something, some tech thing, or I sent my students to a website, and that made a huge difference. Now increasingly we have to answer the question, how do you know? How do you document that? How do you share that with colleagues in a meaningful and appropriate way? So we've been here before, going back to the Plukashans, because the more things change, and look at the things that have changed. How many of you had an IBM PC in 1983 or 1984, or bought a Macintosh? If you got an IBM PC, you probably spent about $2,000, which today would be about $7,500 carried forward, right? Think about how many personal computers and notebooks you could buy for $7,500 today compared to what you got at the time. It's orders of magnitude better for all kinds of stuff in terms of what it does and it allows you to do. Networks and wireless, orders of magnitude better compared to walking floppy disks around, right? Those of you who remember that experiencing. The issues about imaging and the role, you know, however you feel about a learning management system, it's still increasingly part of the core that, that defines a lot and what we do, Web 2.0 on social media. And yet the issues that we're grappling with, we're dealing with costs, budgets, because of the ebb and flow of public funding. We track what happens with IT budgets in our annual survey of CIO, and it's terrible. And the problem is it's a compounding budget cut, because your budget gets whacked, you take a mid-year cut, you go back for next year and during a down economy, well, you're not whacked down where you were two years ago, you're whacked down the, the prior whacking. So there's a compounding effect, if you will. Um, and yet the demand doesn't go away, or the mandates don't go away. Think about something like emergency notification systems. Nobody had an emergency notification system in 2005. After Virginia Tech, it took three years for every campus in the country, almost every campus in the country, to start buying them from third party providers. It comes out of somebody's budget. It comes out of somebody's budget. The issue of infrastructure. We have a far better understanding of infrastructure. Think back, if you will, to the wonderful naivete of the early 1980s and the whole notion of user friendly DOS. Okay, I, because it compared to what was the other what was available, it was user friendly. It wasn't very friendly, um, but it was certainly better. And even insanely great Macintoshes, to quote Steve Jobs, still required user support. And we still, you know, spend a tremendous amount of our resources. We had Eighteen Commodores here. That Eighteen Commodores. <laughs> And there are faculty members at some institution across the country who having mastered a Commodore or a K-Pro says, I've done it once, go find me a CPM browser. <laughs> Those of you, the old operating system has long since vanished, sense of entitlement. We've got issues about, we, we still have huge issues about support, both in terms of instructional uh, assistance for faculty who want to develop materials for our students, whether they're on campus or online. And we've learned that bankers hours, or at least what used to be the old bankers hours, eight to five doesn't work because students work late at night if you look at their traffic patterns, whatever their ages. Um, issues about faculty engagement. Where's the issue about reward? If we talk about the use of technology in instruction, have we expanded the, the algorithm for review and promotion to include something to acknowledge that? 
I do a lot of what I flippantly call show and tell days. Faculty get, and uh, at, at lots of different types of institutions. And it is the opportunity to bring in an outside speaker, talk about some stuff. And the faculty have gotten grants, get an opportunity to show their stuff. I was at one campus some years ago. Um, I w it was a half day program. I was the front end. And then they had 10 faculty members who each got a Warhol unit of time, 15 minutes after the coffee break, to show what they had done with their, their small grants, summer grants, mid-year grants. Um, psychologists, philosophers, physicists, you know, none really cared about what the other was doing, subject area, but they were all kind of intrigued with the technology. They all sort of had a common theme as you render down the presentations. Uh, this was really exciting, it was really interesting. We didn't, weren't able to do all we had hoped to do, but it shows great promise. We're even getting some interest from colleagues at other institutions who've heard about this. We kind of went off on a couple of tangents because we either made some bad choices or got some bad advice but it seems to be working. We are forever indebted to Steve. Steve is the undergraduate work-study student who writes code, or the graduate student who's the indentured servant, who's working for the faculty member to work, get all this stuff ready for the presentation. And the closing comment is, oh, and by the way, to my departmental colleagues who are here, I know I've fallen on a digital sword because you don't believe that this matters when it comes to review and promotion. If we say technology matters, then we should expand the algorithm to allow for that in the presentation for review and promotion. Um, and the issue about IT planning is also part of the conversation as well. These things don't change. The technology has gotten so much easier. It's not about the technology. So let me, let me switch and talk about some of the stuff that we get from our surveys about mapping the terrain. Looking at our annual survey of CIOs, which is now in its 22nd year. It's the largest continuing study of IT in American higher education. Also a little bit of some stuff from our managing online ed survey, which we launched three years ago with WCET. Looking at what we call the managerial middle. Uh, the Sloan Foundation had done, has been doing a very good job looking at some of the macro issues about trends in online ed, tracking numbers, and also the micro environments of, of what's going on in some of the courses. There were huge questions about the managerial middle. Is your program profitable? What are the enabling technologies? Who's the operating officer? Um, what do you do about faculty training? Do you have mandates? How are you dealing with ADA? And I want to touch on some of these things in terms of what they say about what's going on with technology uh, broadly defined. And I, I want to come down very hard against what I think is the false dichotomy between online and on campus. Too often we see this conversation in too many instances about the online program. It is different. Well, at the end of the day, it may be different, but at the end of the day, if I'm a student in a widgets course, I don't get a pass or I don't get extra credit because I took it online or on campus. The transcript just says I learned widgets. It's how much and how well did I learn widgets, not if I learned it online or on campus. Any more than if I took a widgets course from a senior professor or a junior professor from a Nobel laureate or from somebody just out of graduate school. It, you know, what, what the end of the day and the end of the record or the conversation when I go in for work is not who did you take the course from, what do you know? And so the, the, this kind of false silos that we're creating in this environment just don't work and make no sense. First, let's talk about learning management systems. I suspect that we're, we're experiencing some semantic remorse about the notion of learning management systems only because it puts, it, it, it was sort of the right way to present this at, at the time when these products began to emerge in the late 1990s. But if you think about what, what's involved when you say a learning management system, it's all on the faculty side and it's not about student engagement. These things really, and honestly, look, let's be frank, emerge as a way to help faculty get stuff to the web. You don't want to write code, you need some way to put some stuff up for your class, a syllabus, other kinds of resources. And it became, and then you think about the add-ons, grade books and other kinds of resources that became part of the LMS. It was a way of helping faculty manage that process. It didn't necessarily foster student engagement. It wasn't clear that it fostered student learning. It took a long time before we got some research that said that they might, but it really was based on the basic learning psychology about time on task. Uh, what we do know is that every campus in the country, for all practical purposes, has a learning management system. 90% of institutions have standardized on one, so that the physics department doesn't use something different than the philosophy department, which was not uncommon 10, 12 years ago. What we also know is that the deployment is still rising, but it's not ubiquitous. You know, we see, so you can see the numbers by sector in terms of the percentage of classes that are making some use of an LMS. Here's the other thing that we don't know. Some folks are making, it, the 80-20 rule applies, 80% of the activities and 20% of the application. Some folks are using it just to throw the syllabus up and do some very basic things. Others are making very in-depth and, and interesting use of some of the features and functionality. But we do know that the learning management system matters, or something like that. Again, we're seeing the conversation change to student engagement platforms. We're seeing new providers come into the market. This has become a very competitive market. 
Uh, Blackboard, which was sort of the early market leader, has seen dramatic, some shifts in its market share. Lots of campuses are reviewing their strategy about Blackboard. In Picard, because if they're on WebCT or Angel, Blackboard has announced it's going to sunset those applications. You, you have an up or out choice between go to the next level of Blackboard or find something else. But we know that this matters. How do we know that this matters? What happens when the learning management system goes down? Anybody? If I offer you a t-shirt, will somebody tell me? I mean, there's a lot of anger and frustration, right? It's like when email goes down. Does any, with, you know, with due respect to the folks in the back rooms who run uh, accounts payable, does anybody care if accounts payable is out for an hour or three? You know, learning mad, the LMS goes out or email goes out for 30 nanoseconds, boom. People are all over you, especially if it's Sunday nights during midterms or finals weeks. You know, they will come out to your house, they will yell and scream at you, you know. LMS is critical to this process these days. And what's interesting about the LMS, it's the one technology that's on, that everybody uses. It's on both sides of the screen. It's not like the administrative system that's primarily a small group in back rooms, but it's students and faculty members who are contributing to this process. Everybody has their finger on that screen, wherever it might be. So that's it. Lecture capture is emerging as a key resource across many institutions. Uh, we asked CIOs how important is lecture capture. You can see the numbers, 80% in public research universities, 70% uh, in community colleges. This is not a matter of online or on campus. This has become almost an expectation of entitlement, particularly for lower division courses. It's not a matter of students using it to skip class. It's a matter of you students using it as a way to supplement their notes. I want to go back and look. And it's not just undergraduates. Admittedly anecdotal, a friend of mine rents a guest house rents an apartment uh, to a medical student at UCLA, first year med student. UCLA has taped all the lectures, not just the ones that are dry, but also the anatomy sections. She reports that she's spending a lot of time looking at that material, not because she doesn't want to drive to campus, but because I can go back and see it a second or a third time. And while the deployment numbers on lecture capture and podcasting are low, this one looks like it's got an interesting trajectory. And we're seeing some technologies that are coming to the market that integrate with the learning management system or don't. I would caution you, even as this is an entitlement, this is also a can of worms. Why? Because you get into questions about who owns the content on the lecture. Is it, does it belong to the campus? Is it mine? How do you catalog it? How do you archive it? Who's allowed to see it? Who's allowed to access it? All <coughs> kinds of issues that, that have not been well thought out at many institutions. Mobile apps. How many of you have smartphones? How many of you have mobile apps on your smartphones? A sense of entitlement? You know, whether it's parking spaces, um, speed traps, Netflix, Kindle, whatever it is. And lots of campuses have moved to mobile apps. Again, CIOs are telling us this is an important part of our expectation. And if you look at the population of what students own today, 97% of college students own a cell phone and almost half of those own a smartphone. And we know the numbers are going to go up regardless of income level. We still know that those, you know, they may, they may vary by income level, but we know as the prices of cell phones drop and wireless programs and plans become more readily available, more and more students are going to own these things and they're going to expect the enti an entitlement mentality about having access to these resources on campus. Not just wireless, but also apps. And, wireless, and mobile apps on campuses are not about the LMS. It's about moving the portal functions to the screen of a smartphone. Yeah, there may be an LMS app in there, but it's about portal services, class schedules, bus schedules, athletic program schedules, other resources. Can I make payments? Can I do other kinds of things? Just as we see it in the consumer economy. So these are the numbers in terms of the deployment of mobile apps for fall 2010. My guess is when we have these numbers for fall 2011 in October, we're going to see a big jump in terms of the number of campuses that are doing this, in part because also more providers have come into the market to provide different price points for making mobile apps available. Future bodes well for e-books. How many of you uh, own some kind of e-reader device or have put the Kindle reader app or the Nook app on something, reading online? Consumer market is taking off, as you know. You've read lots of reports about this. Uh, whether it's iPads, there's great expectations about what's going to happen in the higher ed market in terms of textbooks. It's, my take is it's going to take a long time. They're not there yet. We expect that there's an expectation, for example, that e-textbooks are going to be a lot less expensive. They're not. We've got some evidence to indicate part of that is because when you go to digital, all you do is effectively eliminate the shipping and the uh, pr uh, printing costs. The largest part of the costs are developmental costs. And that still stays with you. But we're seeing, we're seeing movement for the adaptive technology products, the turnkey products, 
the, uh, our license, but the traditional tomes are going to take longer. But it looks like you know there's a trajectory there. We're going to see a lot more of this, but it's going to take a good bit of time. Students, again, are going to come and say the expectation. But the burden on this one is not on the institution. It's on the publishers and the providers. And the early data from students indicates that they don't like these things. They don't trust these things. In fact, the survey released just last week of undergraduates asking about their ebook experience indicated for, for those students who actually bought ebooks, it was about 18% had some kind of digital curricular product that they used. It was first and foremost because it was mandated by the faculty as opposed to affirmed by the students. And the most telling indicator of about response to ebooks when students were presented with a hypothetical, if you had your choice of buying something you needed for your widgets course, and the price were the same for the following, a, a new book, a used book, a rented book, an e-book, what would you choose? Only 4% said they would choose an e-book. Interestingly, 17% said they would choose a used book over a new book. Why? Because of the value added of somebody else's marginal notes, presumably. So it's a very interesting situation in terms of e-books. We talk about something called the Digital Puck Awards Campus Computing. Those of you who follow hockey may recall that Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player, said that um, he was successful because he went to not where the puck is going, but where the puck is, but where the puck is going. And I think that's the metaphor you have to use in understanding technology. So we gave out, we, we announced our first Digital Puck Awards last year. And based on the, some of the data you've seen already, mobile apps, yes, we're moving from browsers to screens. Students expect and feel entitled to the convenience of campus resources in their pocket as opposed to sitting in a fixed place or having to pull a computer out of their backpack. E-books are still an ever-arriving technology. People forget that Barnes and no Sony started offering e-books 20 years ago. Barnes and Noble offered the Rocket Book in 2000, failed. So this is, in one sense, the third coming of e-books. And they are exploding in the consumer market, but understand, the e-books have been targeted not to college students, you know, the typical consumer is somebody 45 to 60 years old, more women than men, who are buying e-books. They want the convenience of being able to port these around, whether it's a Kindle or a Nook, in terms of a platform, or those apps sitting on some other device. And lecture capture, which again, becomes a convenience for students. They can go back and review, but raises some interesting questions about what are we going to do all this stuff now that we've got it? How do we archive? How do we catalog? How do we deal with intellectual property issues and rights? I want to move to some issues about online education because it speaks again to the technology environment. We uh, survey a group that we believe, we've been led to believe, are the senior officers for IT at their institutions. One of the interesting questions with online ed is people think, well, it, all the problems are off campus. We could do this if it weren't for the accreditors and the regulators and people or federal regulations about student aid. In fact, when we asked people, what are the efforts that impede your, what things impede your efforts? to expand your online program. It wasn't employer resistance to people taking online courses. It wasn't accrediting agencies or union agreements or program accreditations. It was we don't have the necessary resources to build infrastructure and faculty resistance to teaching online. Concern that I'm going to be replaced or I'm going to have an overload of students or I need special skills and training. These are internal issues. They're not, it's not faculty resistance to the technology necessarily, but it's a faculty resistance maybe to not being able to touch safe touch in that process. I can't monitor in a way that I'm used to. How does it change the relationship between me and my students over the screen as opposed to on the other in, in a classroom? Um, what we suspected and what was confirmed by the survey, effectively what we're doing online is effectively what we're doing on campus. And that raises some interesting questions about student assessment. If most of what you're doing in your online courses and programs are the same things that you're doing on campus, how are you, what are you doing in terms of testing and assessment in those courses? Again, the widget course. Some of us are taking it online, some of us are taking it on campus. When it comes to the syllabus and the final, are we using a common syllabi and a common final to deal with common metrics for the outcome to see how much have students learned? Or in fact, are we all over the map at the whim of individual instructors, some of who are teaching online, some who are teaching on campus, in terms of the curriculum and the assessment of that widget course? raises some interesting issues in terms of, of, of assessment, of outcomes, feedback to students, feedback to faculty, and let us be candid, also faculty prerogatives. I have a right and, and I have a history of teaching this way. My colleague who may teach the same course by title and number teaches a different way. We believe we get to the same outcome through different paths. How do you know if that's the case? Because these are fair questions. ADA compliance has been in the news lately. And as we see more and more students coming online, 
We see more and more in the wake of the economy, students of all ages coming back, and with that, disabled students with, uh, with whatever kind of disability they bring. This data is a recipe, these data are a recipe for a lawsuit. Leaving ADA compliance in your online program in the hands of faculty is a recipe for a lawsuit, and we've seen that already. In fact, ironically, the day we announced the results of the 2010 Managing Online Ed Survey, Penn State was, filed, was served with a lawsuit by the National Federation for the Blind for their online program. Kindle, uh, well not Ki Kindle three years ago launched a consortium with a number of institutions as a pilot project, not that they launched the Kindle academic product. It was, we've got this product that seems to have some interest in the consumer market, We'd like to work with a couple of institutions to understand how we, what we need to do better in the campus community. Several institutions, one institution, ASU, was sued by the American Federation for the Blind. They spent a tremendous amount of time and money in lawsuits and depositions. Other institutions felt the heat on this issue of using the Kindle from either the Department of Education or the Department of Justice. And this was a pilot project. It wasn't a mandate that students had to be in these courses. They could opt out. So all campuses are subject to ADA compliance. Leaving this in the hands of individual faculty members who are building online courses is, a, is an invitation to a lawsuit. Tech support is part of this as well. It's critical to have tech support for faculty who are building materials. It's critical to have tech support for students who are online. I'm, I'm often at campuses and somebody will take, uh, to talk about online programs and other stuff, somebody will take me aside, this is Safe Touched On, they say, we, you know, look at the stuff that we've built, Here's, look at the list that we give to our students. Isn't it great, because we, we've gone through a lot of testing on this, we really have this down in terms of understanding the information we need to give to our students about how we go online and how we support them. And I look at the list and they tell them, yeah, you should have a recent computer, you should have broadband, don't, don't try to do this over the telephone, it's gonna take forever, a couple of other things. And I go through the list and then I say, well, you're missing something. They say, no, we can't be missing anything. We have tested this for five years, we get better and better. You're missing something, it's really critical. Okay, smart ass, what are we missing? Well, you don't ask them if they've got a 14-year-old in the house. Well, why would we ask them if they have a 14-year-old in the house? Because your user support closes at eight o'clock in the evening, and your online students are gonna be working from seven o'clock until two o'clock in the morning. And they're gonna look for help. And if they don't have a 14-year-old to do tech support, they're gonna be in trouble. That's gonna be a disincentive for their engagement. That disincentive is gonna be a catalyst for them to drop out and be unhappy, and then tell people that your program sucks. This, if you, we are building, unfortunately, a Potemkin campuses, online and on campus, with the rush that's come back in the wake of the economic downturn, particularly at community colleges, in the rush to offer courses, we're not providing the, the infrastructure for students and faculty that's essential. It's not enough to say we offer the widget course on campus or online. We've got to provide resources and services for the students who are taking those courses academic advisors, occupational counselors, developmental ed, assistance for the faculty who may want to use technology resources in the class, user support services for the students who are taking those classes. Uh, this is uh, actually from one of the Sloan surveys several years ago. Sloan C Consortium asked provosts compare, and this is again the false silo between the online and on-campus programs, or what I would characterize as the false silo. Tell us, is your online activity about the same, better, or not as good? as your on-campus program. And so you look at the numbers, you know, overwhelmingly, you know, few, very few are telling us, uh, actually this is from our survey, I'm sorry, I've got the slide mixed up. This is from, from our survey we do with Managing Online Ed. Very few people are telling us that what we do is not as good. The question is, how do you know? Everybody's making inferential assumptions. Nobody has any evidence one way or the other. We saw this with a Sloan survey, which I, I started to allude to as well, asking provosts, online versus on-campus better. Provost said overwhelmingly it's either as good or better. How do they know? Were provosts taking those courses at 8 o'clock, at, at 10 p.m. in the evening? Were they online over the weekend? Were they sort of the blind, you know, sort of the, the faux caller going into the help desk at 2 o'clock in the morning? You know, we make these assumptions. How do you know? Well, now we need to know. The stakes are high. It has consequences for our students. If we don't know, we are setting them up for failure. We're not providing the infrastructure and resources that they need. It's not sufficient, as we know just from the definition of access and how we have learned from the 40-year conversation of access, 45, in the wake of following the, the Higher Education Act of 1965, where the preamble begins, let all who are able. We know that access alone isn't sufficient. Infrastructure is hand in glove with access. That applies for on-campus programs as much as it applies for online and the use of technology. What else do we have here? 
So let's talk about assessment and outcomes. This is the Spellings Commission report. Anybody read the Spellings Commission report out several years ago? Every 10 years, we seem to get some document like this from a government agency or a government commission or a foundation. Higher education is in deep and dire trouble. Higher education costs too much. Generates a cover on Business Week or Newsweek or US News and World Report. The continuing high cost of higher education. I've been doing, high, I've worked in higher education for 40 years or over four decades. Every 10 years we get one of these things. This is what the Spellings Commission, this, I think what's different about Spellings is this one seems to have legs in the sense that it will not fade away even as Mrs. Spellings is no longer in Washington because it's, it's resonating in state capitals and there were parallel movements going on in state capitals as well. Uh, too few Americans are prepared to participate and compete. We, we've known that for a long time. Uh, costs are just way out of whack and yet we still keep raising costs. And we get into this dumb conversation with the legislature. We're gonna cut the budget and we will not let you raise tuition to offset the lost money that we're taking out of the, bu out of the public budget in community colleges and public four-year institutions. But, but you still expect us to offer the same level of service. How is that gonna work out? And yet it's happening in state after state. And accountability, there's inadequate transparency. You don't know and you're not sharing it with anybody in terms of what's really going on. Interestingly, we asked presidents in our survey, the Presidential Perspective Survey, how well does your institution use data for decision making? Uh, again, on a scale of one to seven, not effective, very effective, uh, with the exception of private doctoral universities who said, well, we had over half that said we're pretty good at that, and even 50% isn't a great number. Look at the number of presidents who in the privacy of a late night online questionnaire acknowledge that their institutions are not very good about using data to enhance decisions. Now, we might offer presidents the benefit of the doubt saying, I don't have the data I need, but in many instances, they do have a lot of data. And still, the institutional culture is not one that's driven by data to aid and inform. So in the risk of shameless self-promotion, this is from an article I wrote just after the release of the Spellings Commission, this cries out for the conversation about not assessment, but analytics. How do we use the same analytical tools which are being widely used in the consumer and corporate economy, bring them to campus to aid and inform what we do? We collect a tremendous amount of data about our students in student information systems, the transactional data from learning management systems, and a variety of other stuff, and yet it sits there fallow. Or we don't have the necessary analytic tools that are being widely used elsewhere that could aid and inform a lot of what we do at the institutional level, at the program level, feedback to students. That's the challenge we confront. And to use that process, to use the analytics, you folks use iAnalytics for some of the work that you do at, at Coppin State. Use those resources as a resource, not as a weapon. How do we help you do better? Not how do we penalize you? How, not how do we, it's a resource as a weapon. I wanna to touch on one other issue, which I think is important in the conversation about technology. Um, this institution has made significant investments in technology. Um, not everybody has. And yet, despite the institutional investment, despite the public pronouncements, and again, I'm not speaking about Coppin State at this point, but over the last 20 or 30 years of presidents and provosts and IT officers about the importance and, and, and issues about technology, at the end of the day, the choices of technology are not about mandates, it's about affirmation. I can do this or I don't want to do this. Does it work for what I do or does it not work? Will it help me and my students or will it just get in the way? How do I, how do I deal with that? I think for a lot of faculty, for a lot of us, I know certainly my own experience, a lot of this ultimately comes down to visualization. Again, I said earlier about the issue of we would invest in the early adopters hoping they would in fact, turns out they often, too often intimidate. But I think there is a question about the conversation about technology for faculty, which really is one about visualization. And, and what I mean by that is, can I see myself doing this? Will it help what I do? Can I see myself using this? Uh, most of us don't think about visualization on a day-to-day -day basis or even hour to hour, and yet we do it unconsciously all the time. You know, in terms of choices that we make about something every day is, is, is con a dress, attire. I speak at some 20 to 30 academic events and campus events each year. It used to be the hard part was content. How do I prepare? That's easy these days. The hard part is what do I wear? because my attire signals something to you, doesn't it? You know, I'm here today and I'm you know, fully dressed, properly dressed, yeah. but when I started my career as a, as a young academic, there wasn't a choice. You know, we all put on the armor, right? We put on a suit, we put on a tie, you know, late, late 70s, uh, women wore those floppy bow ties, 
other kind you know, that were sort of their analog to what the men were doing. But we all dressed. There wasn't a choice. Yeah. You got dressed. You were going into a, a professional environment. Yeah, and a lot of that has changed over time. On the other hand, if I wanted to send some signals to you, part of my choice in, in being here today, that I'm an academic, uh, not currently don't have an institutional affiliation, but I have in the past, you know, I might say, well, you know, my other choice is I could be here in academic regalia. My tweed jacket, my khaki pants, turn me around, there'd be a chalk stripe on the back of the, you know, from leaning into the backboard. Um, and, and that would be a, a acceptable choice as well. My third option for some groups in a prior uh, chapter of my life, I was once the vice president of a now dead.com 12 years ago. Um, and we had, it, it was a grand and glorious experience. We spent $200 million of other people's money. Um, it turns out the technology that we developed is now coming back. It's not roaring back, but it's coming back. Um, so, but if I wanted to send a signal about sort of my technology industry experience, I might be here today in Internet War, channeling Steve Jobs. All black, which is, you know, the, the attire of the industry, the technology industry, and also I live in Los Angeles, the film industry. And that, too, would send a message. And then my other option, I thought, well, you know, my other I could be here in my red dress. <laughs> Footnote, those of you who are very... You put that on. Pardon? You really put that on. I will not confirm or deny. <laughs> but uh, for those of you who are... Technology can do a lot of things. I, I've read that on the internet, yeah. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who are truly observant, you'll notice that they are age-appropriate opaque hose. The men are clueless, the women... God, he gets it. All right. Um, but if I were here in my red dress today, actually my red... And this is a little more Talbots than it is Bloomingdale's, obviously. I grew up in the Midwest. If I were here, I would feel awkward, I would feel impotent, I would feel exposed, I'd feel stupid. I think that for many, none of you, of course, but many of you may have colleagues, that the conversation about technology is almost essentially about that visualization issue. Can I do this? Do I feel empowered? Will it make a difference in what I do? As opposed to user-friendly DOS, it's easy. It's a level of comfort, and our comfort with the technology resources ultimately is conveyed to our students in terms of their, what we show and what we demonstrate. And that's been, that's been the hard part for many. Because again, how many of you are trained as computer scientists? Okay, I mean for most of us, this is something that we've had to bolt on in addition to all the other stuff that we do to keep current in our careers. It's been part of the rising lowest common denominator. Most of us never expected to use this kind of technology. And yet, this is now core to what we do. You know, Love, hate email and all the other things that go with it, if we took away your computers for a week, think about the chaos that would create in your lives, your professional lives, let alone, I don't want to talk about the Facebook part, but just think about, you know, what would that mean if you had to go back to, to living in a paper world in a world with acetates and overheads as opposed to some, and, and no access to the web for resources. Think about what I jokingly call, and I'm very careful about this, instruction interruptus in many classrooms. You know, in an older time, a student would ask a question and would, well, we don't know, so let's, who's going to go to the library and come back on Tuesday? We well, don't have to go to the library. Somebody sits in the back of the room. They do a couple of keystrokes. Yeah, we've got an answer. Uh, on the other hand, the flip side of that is a new level of Oedipal aggression in the classroom because students or faculty members are doing presentations and some smart ass is sitting in the back, looks up from Facebook, and says, oh, by the way, Professor Green, Dr. Green, yo, uh, that's a nice presentation, but I'm on the website for the New York Times, the Library of Congress, the National Science Foundation, whatever it might be. Your stuff's five years out of date. I've, think about the opportunity to reach faculty members. You know, we love it when students read stuff. And they, all, and, and they do the full homework assignment. Now it's not a matter of them finding us as the only experts. They can actually go online, go to a directory at another institution. Oh, Dr. Spicer, I read your article. It was really interesting. How'd you get my article? Well, I'm in Green's class. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know Green was using my stuff. Yeah, how's you using my stuff? Can I see the syllabus? Yeah, I'll send you the syllabus. Well, actually, Green doesn't have a website. I'll scan it and send it to you. So student then comes back on Tuesday. That article that you assigned from Spicer was really interesting. Oh, that's great. I'd be happy to talk with you about it. No need. I talk with Spicer. You talk with Spicer. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, he's at Acme College on the website. I sent him an email. He responded over the weekend. He was really intrigued that you were using 
his article in the course. He asked if I could see the syllabus, and I hope you don't mind. You, you don't, I couldn't give him your website, so I scanned it and sent it to him. And then he asked a little bit more about the course. Maybe I should just hand you the printout and leave. But um, on page four, I, I printed the whole thing out. Spicer says you've misrepresented his work. <laughs> Page six, he kind of asked me aside, how is it they let you teach here? <laughs> Opens up a whole new world. It, and, and it's a new, whole new set of challenges. It can be a great challenge, but it, it's, again, it's part of the new landscape. So what are the continuing challenges? It's about people. Ultimately, the conversation about people, honestly and redundantly, is not about the technology. It's how the technology aid and inform and advance. The people aspects, the learning aspects, the institutional policy and mission and planning. It's about attending to tech trends but not being caught up in them. Yeah, iPads are wonderful. They're great devices. They're not going to change the world tomorrow. It's going to be a long time. You know, we're going to see some interesting applications emerge for education as we saw with the first microcomputers. But think about how far we have progressed from the first IBM PC today in terms of what we thought it would do in the transformation or Edison thinking that film would supplant books. Hasn't happened yet. So it's an iterative process, it's a hybrid process, we each have to find our own way. It's about faculty support. First and foremost, if faculty feel comfortable, if faculty feel engaged, if faculty feel empowered, that will carry on to students. It's creating the infrastructure to make that work. It's about investing in infrastructure, which is about faculty support, but it's also student support as well. And part of that also, honestly, is expanding the algorithm. I mean, we get data, we ask. CIOs, have you expanded the algorithm? And even institutions that have an explicitly teaching mission, it's still only 50, 30 or 40%, 30 percent at best, report that the, the review and promotion process has been expanded to incorporate some component of technology for those who wish to stand on it. You don't have to, but at least it's there if you feel that's an important part of your portfolio. And it's about bringing data to the conversation, not as a weapon, but as a resource. Not what are you doing wrong, but how do we do better? Thank you. You've been a very patient and generous audience. Thank you.